Hi all, welcome to this lecture, Introduction to AWS Networking. Uh, I know a uh, lot of people think that networking is complex, but uh, it's really important that you understand AWS Networking well because it's a backbone of your architecture. It decides, you know, whether your application would be able to scale, uh, how you have implemented security at different level of uh, uh, OSM model of networking, layer, layer 3 to layer uh, 7. So uh, if you might have seen my earlier uh, video, Introduction to AWS Services, where I talked about how different AWS services work together uh, and I had taken a sample use case of fb.com. Now in this lecture, we are going to see uh, overview of AWS networking services. So intent is not to uh, explain each and every networking services in very depth, but to uh, you know let you know how all these services um, serve you when you design your architecture. So uh, why do you need to learn AWS uh, networking services? Uh, because in my opinion, whether you are a developer or a DevOps or a network admin, uh, certain networking aspects you should know while working in AWS. So if you are a developer, you must know VPC basics and uh, there are things like VPC address space, um, CIDR, internet gateway, subnets, root tables, NAT, different type of IP addresses, and then firewalls, so security group and network ACLs. Along with that, you should know uh, load balancer service, CloudFront, uh, then Route 53, which is DNS service, and some of the uh, gateways which can be used within VPC. So which uh, has VPC endpoint, private link, and if you need to have a communication between multiple VPCs, you can have VPC peering. So at least these many networking services a developer should know. Uh, if you are DevOps, uh, I would probably expect more services uh, to be familiar with, uh, like a transit gateway, transit uh, VPC, site to site VPN, client VPN. And as a DevOps, it is also required to do network automation. Now being a virtual network, you can create all these networking components using um, a cloud formation or uh, using AWS CLI. On top of it, you should also be able to capture the network traffic flowing in and out of your VPC and uh, different uh, components like a load balancer. Uh, for that, you should know how to log this uh, traffic and how to monitor this traffic. Finally, if you are a network administrator, the expectation are for the more and you should know in and out of AWS Direct Connect and advanced features of VPC. So you should know at uh, enhanced networking where uh, as of today, AWS supports like up to 25 Gbps uh, bandwidth between EC2 instances, uh, hybrid connectivity uh, uh, where some of the workloads run in AWS and some of the workloads are running in on-premise network. Uh, how to improve the network performance at different layers and then how to uh, have the network security at layer 3 protecting DDoS attacks or layer 7 attacks. So uh, these, these are something which I think uh, uh, many different roles uh, should uh, know uh, but it's up to you what kind of experience you have and what role probably you are working at. So uh, let's get into the introduction of AWS networking services. So I'm sure you're familiar with this uh, architecture uh, into my earlier video. And I that time I told like, you know, this uh, most of the services are within VPC, which is a virtual private cloud and which is an isolated private uh, network, uh, which is set for you into the AWS. And you control what traffic flows in and out of this network. So we are going to mainly talk about uh, this part, how, uh, where your EC2 will reside, uh, which of these components will be public facing, private facing, and then additionally, we will see uh, more uh, AWS networking services around VPC. Okay, uh, so let's start from the, again, scratch. Uh, first thing you need to have AWS region. So any of the region you can choose to create your VPC. And as you know, while you uh, create a region, you also get multiple availability zones. So for simplicity, I am showing here two availability zones. Now, uh, now you create a VPC. Now VPC scope is region level. That means when you create a, uh, a VPC, uh, you can leverage any of the availability zones to create your uh, EC2 instances and other services. Now every VPC comes with a private IP address range, which is called uh, CIDR or classless interdomain routing. Now how to calculate this CIDR and what does it mean? I have explained in uh, very detail in my next uh, video and I'll encourage you guys to, uh, you know, go through that video to understand how CIDRs are calculated. 
uh, again when you create a VPC uh, it comes with a default local router now what's the purpose of this router is to route the traffic within VPC that means if you now create a uh, multiple EC2 instances in this VPC all these EC2 instances can communicate with each other by default because there is this local router now uh, how but how the traffic flows uh, within VPC who takes the uh, you know routing decision so every VPC comes with something called a main route table and this route table has one entry which is uh, CIDR of uh, the VPC itself and the target is local which means this local router that means any traffic which is going to the uh, destination address which sits inside this uh, address range it will take a local route and that's where all EC2 instances within VPC can talk to each other now uh, VPC is a big address space but ideally you should create subnets inside the VPC in fact you must create subnet in order to launch your EC2 instances now uh, thing here to understand is that if you want to leverage multiple availability zone then you should create your subnets across multiple availability zones uh, now uh, one subnet can be in only one AZ at any moment of time that means one subnet cannot be in two AZs at the same time right um, however one availability zone can have multiple subnets so here I have shown two subnets and they are into two different availability zone and uh, going forward we will probably launch machines uh, in uh, both these subnets so that if one AZ goes down you have another machine running in another subnets and that's where you can have the uh, AZ level high availability now uh, uh, while creating a subnet again you provide the CIDR uh, the address range for the subnet and now you will see the subnet range is smaller here it was 16 uh, so don't go on that number as 24 but this is a smaller address space than this address space and how to calculate that uh, you have to you should watch the video uh, the next video about uh, how to calculate uh, what is VPC subnets and everything that I have explained okay so here I am creating two subnets and I am calling those public subnet but what does this public subnet uh, means by default if you look at this architecture this subnet uh, is again a private so far because you cannot really talk to internet from these subnets because VPC is a private IP address range now in order for this subnet to be able to communicate with the internet first thing you need is internet gateway and this gateway is attached to the VPC now I can communicate uh, uh, from the resources within VPC to the internet but not not really as of now because again if you consider I launched one machine here and try to go to internet or say from the internet I try to go to that machine it will look at this root table of the VPC and there is no route to the internet and that's where still I can't talk to the internet better you create a dedicated root table for your subnets and then these subnets do not follow this main route table and you add an entry into this saying that if the traffic is going to or coming from uh, internet that is 000 slash 0 uh, target should be internet gateway that means now traffic can flow from the internet gateway to your subnets so the definition of public subnet if the corresponding root table of the subnet has uh, entry for the internet through the IGW that is internet gateway it is called a public subnet so typically the web servers or any of the machines uh, like a bastion host uh, typically uh, resides inside the public subnet into any architecture that you will see now uh, if I talk about say databases or an application server which are behind the web server they need not be exposed publicly that means nobody should be able to reach to these instances directly from the outside and these instances also need not have the public IP addresses and that's where we call them as a private subnet so what's the difference in case of private subnet again there is no route to go to the internet directly so you will have a root table and it will also have the same entry like a main root table now if you don't create this uh, specific root table for this subnets all these subnets will follow the main root table but better you always create a dedicated root table for your subnet so that you can control how the traffic flows in and out of your subnets similarly there would be additional subnets for the databases and that would also be a private subnet now if I am to talk about the architecture that we saw earlier for fb.com there was a load balancer and as you know load balancer was a public facing entity and that's where it will uh, reside into my public subnets 
and it will be across two subnets for high availability now this is taken care by AWS you don't need to really worry about underlying uh, computing uh, machines for this load balancer so when you create a load balancer you select which two public subnet it should reside in and automatically AWS provision that now uh, again then you would have web server or app server as uh, talked earlier they should be in a private uh, subnets and they would only have the private IP address that means these instances cannot really talk to internet directly only the way they would receive a traffic is from the load balancer right and finally there would be a database so master database will be in one AZ and the standby database will be in another AZ now as you know uh, you can have the synchronous replication between AZs because uh, the latency is less than 10 milliseconds so you can actually have the synchronous replication between the master and the replication database instance so in case this AZ goes down you have complete replica here available and you are really the uh, you know fault tolerant to AZ so uh, now with this architecture when uh, your users would uh, hit uh, the load balancer the traffic will flow to the load balancer from there it will go to your web or app servers and from there it will go to the database so this is how your uh, your uh, network would look like make sure you take care of the all the routes properly and how to do that i have explained in more detail in my next video okay moving on now if you look at this architecture uh, as i said the ec2 instances in private subnet uh, cannot talk to internet directly and it has two meanings first nobody from the internet can reach to this ec2 instances and neither these ec2 instances can go out to the internet to fetch maybe some uh, details from the internet it's not possible but often that is required right because uh, maybe on this ec2 you want to download some security patch from the internet now you only need an outbound internet connection from here you don't need somebody to reach directly but you want this ec2 to reach to the internet so uh, how this is done this is done using something called nat network address translation so nat are the devices which sits into the public subnet and now they can talk to internet on behalf of this ec2 instances so whenever this ec2 wants to talk to internet it will send the traffic request to the nat nat will route to the internet will take the uh, traffic back and will send the packet back to your uh, ec2 instances in private subnet of course you can do this and again in order for this traffic to flow uh, understand this root table of this private subnet should have the corresponding entry saying like if traffic needs to go to the internet it should go through the NAT so you need to add this uh, root entry your in your root table and then traffic will flow out something like this so these are the very basics of VPC and everybody should understand it and that's what I'm saying I'm not showing it here as a practical but in my next video I'm showing it how to do it step by step so uh, moving on uh, now we want to look at the uh, you know uh, networking beyond your VPC so far we are talking everything about within the VPC so very first thing you will see while you work in uh, on-premises uh, data center and you, some of your workloads are in AWS you know need some kind of hybrid connectivity so what does it mean it means uh, maybe some of your workloads are running on premise and some of your workloads are running in AWS for example uh, critical work, uh, workloads for banks they prefer to run it within uh, their data centers but non critical application they can move to AWS similarly some of uh, uh, companies may run their uh, databases uh, locally and uh, the asynchronous replication might go to the AWS right uh, for having the disaster recovery so this is called hybrid connectivity or for for that matter storage maybe you have primary storage and uh, secondary storage in there in AWS so uh, you have on-premise data centers and there are databases servers and you need a direct connectivity between this and the AWS VPC now how do you do that over a private network if you want to have a dedicated uh, a private network not dedicated but a private network between these two entity so there are two options here uh, for you in AWS one is of course a very popular way where uh, the similar way you connect uh, multiple branches of your companies uh, together using site to site VPN AWS also supports a site to site VPN so that's the first option so on AWS side you would have something called virtual private gateway or a VGW and on your side you would have a router and in AWS terms it's called customer gateway once you have these two gateways created uh, you can create an IPsec VPN tunnel between these two 
and uh, for high availability AWS supports uh, two tunnels so that even if one tunnel goes down traffic may still flow on the another tunnel. So this is how you connect to network and this is a site to site uh, VPN connectivity. Now one thing to understand uh, the traffic here still flows over the internet so blue line uh, indicates the internet uh, that means though it's a uh, uh, secure connectivity because IPsec protocol uh, uh, make sure that all the traffic is encrypted but there is no reliability in terms you might have a patchy internet right so you can't have the dedicated bandwidth that you want uh, for your applications to functions prop function properly right so though it's a uh, secure it's not really very reliable connection but if you have a workloads which really need a consistent bandwidth uh, and a private connectivity to AWS you should rather look at something called AWS Direct Connect. Now uh, how Direct Connect works is uh, AWS has different regions right and uh, the country in which AWS has region there will be a multiple Direct Connect locations. Now these locations are not really owned by AWS but they are owned by uh, a career neutral uh, entities um, like in India there are I think six or seven Direct Connect locations. So these direct correct locations are already connected to AWS corresponding uh, region data center for example they, they are connected to Mumbai data centers if I'm talking about direct connect locations from India and it is connected with very high speed low latency uh, optical fibers there uh, um, uh, more than up to 100 Gbps uh, link. Uh, what you need to do is you need to connect your on-premise network to this direct connect location right in order to get uh, that bandwidth so and this uh, network you can either set up on your own or you can have direct connect partner uh, who can connect uh, from your location to direct connect locations now once you have this link you can get up to 1 gbps to 10 gbps uh, consistent bad bandwidth connection to aws from your data center so a lot of big companies for sure goes for direct connect rather than go, uh, going over to the VPN. So these are the primary two uh, ways to connect your network to AWS. Now uh, moving on, uh, you also know uh, during COVID-9 you have to work remotely and you need to connect to uh, a different network. For example, from your laptop you connect to your company's network over a VPN. Now that's not a site-to-site -site VPN, that's a client-to-site VPN your machine becomes part of that network so that you can access all these machines here in this network as if you are a part of that network right and for that also AWS has something called client VPN endpoints that you create and then you can you can uh, connect to any of this machine uh, by using a client to site VPN now for this on your machine you need open VPN server client uh, and on AWS side you need to again create a subnets that becomes a part of this network only more about this later but then these are the options you have for hybrid connectivity between AWS and either your data center or uh, you want to connect your one machine to this uh, network okay moving on um, as you connect to this VPN you can connect uh, you know any of the AWS services as I just talked about uh, now let's move to VPC to VPC connectivity so far we talked about only one VPC but in real scenario uh, one big application is typically does not reside uh, in and is not really owned by a single team or say a single department maybe in our fb.com example application side is maintained by a different department and uh, all the data processing or data analytics part is being handled by the different teams in that case their workloads will be in their own uh, own VPC for of course for segregation and in certain cases they might also reside in different AWS region as well considering that case if that is a situation where you have multiple VPCs but still you want to talk to each other uh, using a dedicated and a private network between these two AWS provides something called a VPC pairing construct in which say this is VPC A and this is B if they are connected over VPC pairing now any machine from here with a private IP address can talk to any machine here uh, without going over to the internet all this traffic flows over through uh, AWS managed backbone network we call it and uh, 
the best part is the the vpcs on the other end could be owned by the same aws account or different aws account and they could either be in the same aws region or different aws region so this greatly simplifies you know your network and you don't need to unnecessarily expose a public endpoint and talk over the internet this is completely uh, managed by aws now moving on uh, this was the vpc pairing uh, uh, worked well till you know uh, maybe couple of years back uh, but over the time if you have say hundreds of vpcs and all these vpcs needs to talk to each other that becomes a problem for the reason that vpc pairing is non transitive uh, and you need one to one connection between any of the two vpcs that means if there is vpc a vpc b and vpc c for example and all vpcs needs to talk to each other then you need uh four uh a connection so uh, uh sorry three connections a to b b to c and then c to a uh, having a to b and b to c does not mean you can talk from a to c and that's that's where it is called non transitive routing okay so uh with less number of vpcs it's okay but as you move to say 100 vpcs i'm saying and imagine you need to connect 100 vpcs to each other Uh, you want to create a kind of mesh uh, then it's become real problem you can't maintain so many vpc pairing and that's where in 2018 aws launched a new construct called a transit gateway now transit gateway greatly simplifies this use case where all the vpcs which we call typically a spoke vpcs connect to a transit gateway and then transit gateway can connect to your vpc again in a similar fashion now this acts as a hub now every vpc can talk to every other vpc as well as they can also talk to your corporate data center so you can connect your corporate data centers over a vpn or a direct connect to a transit gateway and you already have your vpcs connected so it's a complete mesh of the network traffic so it greatly simplifies your network architecture there are different use cases when to use transit gateway versus vpc pairing and that i think should have a different uh, discussion here so moving on uh, so far we are talking about uh, multiple vpcs now let's dig deep into uh, some advanced features of the vpc and let's start with vpc endpoint services now if you remember our uh, fb.com architecture uh, our web servers uh, need to upload and download data from the s3 Now, as you know, S3 buckets are within the region, maybe in the same region or a different region, but S3 can be accessed over the internet. So, in even in this architecture, even if your in EC2 machines are in VPC, if you want to access S3, the traffic actually needs to go through the internet. That means it will go to the NAT, as explained earlier. From NAT, it will go to IGW, and from there, it will go to the S3. that means you are limited by again uh, you are depending on the internet traffic which is not considered safe if you are not encrypting the traffic also uh, you have to depend on nat um, device bandwidth and for example if sometimes nat goes down for any reason you can't really access the s3 so what aws has done uh, if you have an s3 bucket or a dynamo db in the same aws region as your vpc you can rather use something called vpc endpoint service now once you have a vpc endpoint and you attach to your vpc you actually can uh, reach to s3 or a dynamo db uh, through that vpc endpoint uh, and that means you don't have to really go the internet route and it is uh, automatically this this is a device which is managed by aws and even the there is no bandwidth constraint it scales automatically and it's highly reliable and a robust solution uh, to talk to the s3 so i'll re uh, recommend if you are using internet uh, for the uh, s3 bucket in the same region you can you can just add this vpc endpoint and route your traffic through this now again for all this uh, communication that i'm talking about you have to modify route tables all the time now for simplicity i haven't shown those route tables but for route traffic through the different uh, gateways either in a transit gateway or a vpc peering or a vpn connection or a dx or this vpc endpoint you have to modify corresponding route tables okay moving on so vpc endpoint comes in two flavors vpc endpoint gateway and vpc endpoint interfaces Uh, so gateway is used to reach to s3 or dynamo db but if you want to reach to any other aws service for example you want to access sqs cloudwatch sns ses uh, this is similar right you your your machine would go 
uh, over internet right to reach to these endpoints uh, but with VPC endpoint interface you can again reach to these services privately from your VPC but the way it differs from the gateway is that in case of VPC endpoint it creates something called ENI elastic network interface into your subnet and then the traffic is routed through that ENI to this VPC endpoint services and there are around 60 VPC endpoint services you can reach privately without going over to the internet more about this into uh, following uh, sessions here but that's another thing you need to know okay uh, there is one more aspects of VPC endpoint and that's a private link you might have heard about now let's see what that private link means now what happens uh, is like uh, you might have you might have some SaaS services you might have subscribed to some SaaS services software as a service where the end um, the company or the software provider provides you access to their software now the, the provider might also be running their workloads in AWS and they want to privately expose their service to your VPC or your resources within the VPC of course one of the option is they expose this service through the internet and you access over the internet but as both the VPCs are in AWS uh, you have better options to have this network connectivity we already saw a couple of that that's a transit gateway or a VPC pairing where, where you can access resources across VPCs but in this case uh, SaaS provider does not want to really expose all the machines inside uh, that uh, VPC to your VPC they only want to expose one service out of that which is behind this network load balancer and that's where the uh, private link comes into the picture private link privately exposes only this network load balancer service to your VPC so any uh, EC2 machine right which uh, want to access this SaaS service can go through the VPC endpoint interface through the private link to the network load balancer where uh, it can use those services uh, and the best part is you can expose your services to thousands of VPCs through this private link so instead of opening wide network to the other VPCs uh, through a VPC pairing or a transit gateway it's a pointed uh, or a service level connection uh, between two VPCs so typically in on AWS marketplace you will see most of the software vendors provide uh, their services through the private link okay I think uh, we, we covered a lot of ground here um, let's move on uh, now I have shown in my earlier architecture of fb.com if you want to access your application you can directly uh, use and load balancer DNS which is provided by AWS or you can have fb.com DNS points to the load balancer and then you can access using fb.com URL that's where AWS has a root 53 service where you can manage your hosted zone and inside that you can uh, create a different kind of record sets uh, and uh, for example if you want to access example.com the root 53 will uh, return corresponding IP address of the load balancer and then you can access uh, that over the internet so you don't need to really remember this IP address you just can access using the uh, domain name so that's root 53 and there is much more to it uh, moving on uh, finally uh, you can also leverage CDN services from AWS so that's called CloudFront right and if you remember in my uh, abby.com video I talked about uh, AWS as age location across the world this serves two purpose one your data the static content like a video or um, uh, images are uh, cached at the age locations and the other these age locations are already connected to the AWS over AWS provided uh, backbone network and only users need to connect to a nearest age location so that the latency uh, is reduced and that's where uh, you can introduce CloudFront and then you can have your S3 bucket as origin for the CloudFront or your load balancer could be origin so that users get the minimum latency so flow would uh, remain similar uh, user ask for the IP address of the uh, your application and uh, this time CloudFront uh, sorry uh, root 53 returns the CloudFront age IP users reach to the age IP and from there they can reach to the origin like an S3 or a uh, load balancer so this is how uh, CloudFront works uh, I think uh, 
I covered most of the AWS uh, networking services. Now you can deep dive into each of these services separately and uh, I would have corresponding video released. But uh, if you know all this thing, that's it I think about AWS networking.